Welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and today I'm sitting with Ani Tuzman, who wrote an amazing novel, which we're going to talk about, called The Tremble of Love. But that will come later. This is a two-part interview. So, welcome. Thank you, Thank Marcy. you for coming. I'm happy to be here with you. This is a, kind of a long time coming, us sitting together like this. And the way I often start my interviews is by asking about what in your childhood, especially thinking about your spiritual life and growing up in that kind of a, I'm, I'm thinking about that context of your spiritual life. Um, what happened, what, what parts of your, I mean a lot happened, but what parts of your childhood informs the work that you do now? And, you know, this amazing book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big question. It is a big question, yeah. and I'll try to respond to it um, as best I can. Um, I grew up on a chicken farm, although I was born in New York, shortly after my parents immigrated to the United States oh, okay. on the heels of the Holocaust. And they... So what year were you born? I was born in 48. Oh, okay. My parents came at the end of 47, okay. came over pregnant with me. Huh. And um, so I have to get into broader strokes yeah, here. Yeah, this could take can't. a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I grew up on a chicken farm. We moved there when I was very young. And so one of the key, key influences on my life was the immersion in nature. Yeah. Where, where I grew up, turned out to be very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, we were outside of a refugee settlement yeah. where a lot of uh, Jews had immigrated, but we couldn't afford to buy a farm there, so we were in a, in a place where we were the only Jews. Yeah. And I was the only Jew in my school. And there was, uh, there was ignorance. There was, just, yeah. there was just a lack of understanding yeah. that turned into some um, intense experiences. Yeah, yeah. So two things were going on for me all the time. This um, complete awareness all the time of the shadow of the Holocaust. Sure. My parents' trauma. The word trauma, I don't even know if it existed. Certainly PTSD didn't exist. No. Yeah. And my parents were traumatized. Sure. They'd lost everyone. And so I could feel that and I could feel the yearning to make it easier for them, to lift the pain, to yeah. be good enough to help them. And I never was, <laughs> but um, I tried. And then simultaneously, so there was all this pain and chaos and tears and rage, and, and there were the trees mm. and yeah. the rain. And even the sounds of the chickens, it was a chicken farm, I don't mm -hmm. think I said. Mm -hmm. And so, and there was this immense beauty that, and this sense of communion. So very early, I start, as soon as I could write, mm -hmm. learn to write, I started, and as soon as I could really compose sentences, yeah. I started writing to this invisible companion. Oh, wow. So that brings together, of course, a lot about my Sure. love of writing and my love of supporting others to write. Yes. But I wrote, I told all the secrets that I couldn't burden my parents with. In school, I was shamed and yeah. there was even violence and I couldn't tell yeah. them. I knew that I couldn't burden them with that somehow yeah, as young as I was. So yeah. there was, but I had a place to share that, to ask, even to be angry, which mm -hmm. I didn't dare to do too much of the time, mm -hmm. but I did a little bit as I got older in writing. And so there was, there was both. There was the beauty yeah. and there was this unfathomable grief. Yeah. And there was also, there was darkness yeah. and because my parents believed they should tell us everything. Mm -hmm. So I heard a lot of things I was really too young to hear. And then you had siblings 
come after They were you. younger, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there was, as I said, there was that darkness, and then there was incredible joy mm. um, at the same time, most, most of which was related to my experiences in nature. Yeah. But riding my bicycle and watching the light play on the stream. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I read somewhere uh, when I was, you know, preparing for this about your experiences as a child of ecstasy. So that's pretty cool, you know. A lot of kids may have that, but not even know that's what that is. I didn't know that word till later, but I found that word at some point, I think I was in high school, and I went, oh, that's what it was. Yeah. That's what that was at the same time that there were other sure. feelings. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So that, that's amazing. Um, I don't, you know, I haven't studied children of Holocaust survivors, but I've known some. And the ones that seem most sane, most balanced, most able to walk through life in a healthy way had something. You know, for you, it was the chickens and the, nat you know, the nat natural world. And writing. And writing. Writing, yeah. yeah. So um, my next question, speaking of writing, is a little bit like a prompt, which is something that you do when you have groups, I think. And uh, it's going to lead us into a conversation that we have had, I think, for at least 15 years. So that, I was thinking, how long has it been? But we originally had this conversation a very long time ago. Wow. So the question, the prompt <clears throat> is, is it really all right to be happy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where I'm going with this, as you probably know, is this amazing dream that your father had. Can you, can you talk about that a little? Um, so my father, I've written about this. It, the, the longer story, because I'll try to condense it, is, is on my blog, Harvesting Love. Yeah. Um, finding, and this relates, the, the Subtitle for the blog is Finding Love in Expected and in Unexpected and Expected Places. Yeah. So, the, let's see, to condense the dream, I called my father and he had just had a dream. There's more context in the piece I wrote, I won't go into it all. He was actually very uh, depressed. He was dealing with my mother's Alzheimer's and very despondent. And the night before, had actually done something to, to try to take his life. Wow. And I happened to call him and wake him at 11 in the morning, which is very unusual, but it's because he had been drinking and taking pills and he was really in a mm. sad state. But he had a dream, his first dream of his mother ever mm. since he left her to save his life. In the dream, he was, as he told me, in heaven. And I'd never heard him use the word heaven. He said, Shamayim. And I think he told me that part in Yiddish. And he was, he saw all these women with candles, holding candles. And they were like, they were the age of his mother. They were Eastern European. And he knew his mother was there somewhere. And he became very desperate to find her. And he asked them, has anyone seen Hanala? Has anyone seen Hanala? And finally he saw her. He was led to her. And she was holding a candle that wasn't lit. And he said, Mama Sha, Mama Sha, why isn't your candle lit? Yeah. And she looked at him and said, Arala, you keep putting it out with your tears. Your tears. Yeah. And when and he told me this dream. Yeah. And um and I tried to talk to him a little bit after that, but he didn't yeah. want to. And I shared this dream in a small group the next day. Yeah, when I was sitting there. When you were in yeah. that group. Yeah. And you came up to me afterwards yeah. and said something like, your father, and I shared how painful it was that my father yeah. couldn't hear, couldn't what in my perception, receive his own dream fully, the message sure. from his mother. And you looked at me and mm. said, that dream was for you. Yeah. And many, many years later, I wrote about that. Wow. And, yeah. uh, and that message, because it was a huge question for me, and 
life struggle for me had been, and it's not that it never comes up, but it's certainly transformed. Yeah. It, can I be happy? As it, it, it was there when I was a little, little girl. Is it okay? Is it okay to be happy when not only my parents, but as I grew older? And now, is it okay to be happy when there's starving children? Is right. it okay to be happy in the face of injustice? And of, now I understand, of course, that they're not. It's not either or. Right. right. And my own joy and my own gratitude and my own appreciation for life it strengthens me to face yeah, actually, the rest. I also think it's not, not only is it not either or, but it's, it's mandatory to Amen. be happy. Amen. Because not being happy, thinking that that is going to... Yeah, right. See, and that, it touched me partly also because my growing up, what, what I knew about the Holocaust as a young child, and I actually do have family that suffered and died in the Holocaust, but at the time I didn't know it. But we were taught that the only way to respect the people who had died was to keep their memory alive in the context of the Holocaust. So yeah, it was yeah, intentionally yeah. like a rule. You had to be sad. Yes. You had to yes. see them as victims and oppressed. And I think that is a huge reason why Jews haven't really recovered from this horrific thing. Um, and I'm not saying all Jews are, but just generally it, it speaks to, in my mind, an explanation about Israel and all the fear around right. that. Um, so yeah, it was, it, in my mind, it was a dream for your father, it was a dream for you, right. and it was a dream for, for me. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that post, actually, that I shared it, and then recently I rewrote it and shared it on, on a social media, and I was amazed at how many people it spoke to. Yeah who wrote to me, That's one so man great. wrote to me that he cried for two hours after reading wow. it because it opened something up in him sure. in relation to this very question. Because the notion is that our tears, our sadness, our lament is what keeps the flame from right. continuing. Amen. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I hope it's close by, can you read the poem that you wrote about your father yeah. and the chicken uh, Yes, yes. That would be so sweet to hear it just now when we have him in our hearts okay. and in our minds. <clears throat> so this is called In There With Those Girls. And I actually wrote it on the, uh, my father's 70th birthday. Okay. Uh, family decided to make a, a celebration in his honor. He loved being the center of attention. And I wrote this and read it. In there with those girls. The chickens didn't give anyone their eggs the way they gave them to my daddy, like they loved him. The way he learned their language, ladies, he'd call softly in English and Yiddish as soon as he came through the door. It's just me. Take it easy, he would say. One long word he stroked them with. Take it easy. If I came in the coop with him, they would cackle like crazy, like they weren't going to calm down no matter how nice he asked them. So I would go out and just listen, listen to my daddy sing song, those mean white birds with his tss, 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 and the quetzala and bubala he usually reserved for my mother. He'd roll up his sleeves all the time, making his sweet sounds and looking them right in the eyes sliding his hairy arm under their plump bodies, his fingers stretched in the straw for one of their warm eggs. They would never peck at him or balk. Once in a while, one of them talked back, and my daddy would answer straight off, promising, I won't hurt you, Shana Medela. You don't need to worry. He never ran out of sounds. He'd have whole conversations while he filled the wire baskets with eggs that cooled quickly. In Uncle Menashe's kitchen in the Bronx, my daddy said he hated the stink of the coops, the dust, having to worry about the price of eggs dropping. 
He knew the big farms, the ones that did it all by machine, would sooner or later drive the small farmers out. The handwriting was on the wall, he would have said, if he knew English idioms. He complained instead, it's a fashtink in a business, that's all there is to it. <laughs> but in there with those girls, he was someone who threw the clock away, moving among them like he was dancing, like he was making love, as if he'd been born on a chicken farm, clucking to them all the way, soft clucks, staccatos, whispering that they were so good, so beautiful, such dedicated mothers. Wow, that's so great. Mm. And you read it so beautifully. I thought it would be a fun, those sounds. It's fun, fun to read, yeah. yeah. And I really, I could see him and feel him again. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about the writing workshops that you lead. And are you still doing the ones for children? Yeah, and is that's, I don't know if that's how we first met or later, yeah. but in any case, I, I started doing them. Uh, doing writing groups for children shortly after coming to the valley were my first ones actually mm. when I was pregnant with my daughter and then brought her we used to do a lot of them in nature and uh, go right in nature and continued so that what started in around 1980 or 81 mm -hmm. and, if, and I was part of Amherst Writers and Artists started the mm -hmm. youth division oh, okay. and the first children's workshops that Amherst Writers and Artists offered before they even were Amherst Writers and Artists oh. and then um, was not became did it on, on my own and uh, and called began to call it Dance of the Letters mm -hmm. after a profound experience that I had in India actually and mm -hmm. and just had these wonderful experiences supporting uh, children and then teenagers to find and free their voices mm -hmm. and not not do it in any right way. Just, I would offer writing sparks. And, and then now I'm not working, I moved and across the river <laughs> and now I'm working with women or working, playing, writing, yeah. engaging, holding, beautiful sacred space with women over started over 50 over 60 over mm. 70 um yeah and wow. they're quite wonderful quite wonderful yeah yeah i didn't actually remember your connection to um amherst writers and artists so lena my daughter who was in your groups uh she took the training uh -huh. And she actually led groups, writing groups for the women and their children at the Safe Passage shelter when she was in high school. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that is an amazing forum or yeah. format, yeah. I think is the word I yeah. want. The, the format of how to open up people for, right. for absolutely hearing their own voice. Abs and, yes. And the kids... Uh, the kids would write something in Spanish because they, that's their first language, and they would get so excited, they'd say, oh, well, maybe I can try writing in, in English. And then it became like a literacy issue, you know, a, a, right. a push for literacy right. as well as Very the other wonderful. stuff. Very wonderful, yeah. Yeah, so, so many ways to open a person. And yeah. just to make a, a quick connection, uh, it took me years to realize that in doing the writing groups, in a certain sense, I was, you could say, making amends to the young one that I was because mm. when I was in school, I was silenced and having a voice was a very frightening thing and having a different voice. My first language was in English and right. all of that. And then some of that continued into college when I was told wow. I wrote about feelings, I was a poet, yeah. and the editors of the magazine told me I, it was right before the women's movement, and they basically said, you write like a girl, and they said, you know, I should write more intellectually. Yeah. And it, there was a theme of my voice not being okay, yeah. or it even being dangerous to have a voice, and certainly to be different. I mean, I was different in every conceivable wow. way, including my voice. So I didn't even consciously realize yeah. until years later that these containers I co-created with the others there sure. 
were what I didn't have Wonderful. as a young person. Yeah. So yeah. that was the realization. And it's so, it, hearing it, it sounds so frustrating to me because just had you come with your whole baggage, all your so story being exactly the same, but maybe 20 years later, yeah. You would have been easy peasy, right? You know, in terms of all the <coughs> feminist uh, stuff and acceptance for being an immigrant and old, you know, all of it. It's, um, but it's of kind course, of interesting. all that we go through as it is forms our sure. heart. So, sure. Yeah. But yeah, I do think that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, we're coming to a close in part one, and we're going to talk mostly about Tremble of Love in part two. But I wanted to just kind of ask you about your spiritual practice a little bit, not to get too uh, personal, because it can be a very private thing. I, I understand that very well. But there is a quality that you have, the way that you're in touch with yourself. And um, it's not that typical for people who don't have that kind of inner life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you would talk about that a little. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because this will probably tie together your first question with how did my childhood and, and then yeah. my spiritual life now. So that the heart of my spiritual practice, my spiritual life is, and spiritual is a funny word, I think everything's yeah. spiritual, so, sure. but meditation. Mm -hmm. And, and nature, experiencing mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. So being in the presence of nature and meditating. And I had, I w it was, uh, golly, in the 70s or 70s, early 70s. And I, like many, was, I didn't know the term even, but I was a seeker. Mm. And I was going to, in a, in a week, I remember I went to a Sufi event. I went to a Hasidic, I don't know if it was Zalman or Shlomo Karlach or oh, whomever. Yeah. Um, Sufi, Hasidic, there was a holy order. I live in Boston, this very progressive Christian church. Yeah. Uh, and the Vedanta temple. I just, to me, it was, and I love Vedanta, had all the symbols and all, that it's all one. Mm. And it, it felt that way to me. There was yeah. no no conflict. It was delicious to find and to be meditating and also to hear people talk about God yeah. and all these names. And then I met a teacher mm -hmm. and experienced, and that was Swami Muktananda, Baba Muktananda. And I, um, <laughs> I'll just say one story. I, I, I was um, at an event. I'd been brought by other people and my mind was screaming. And then I saw people bowing and, and my mind was just, I don't do this, I don't do this. And I heard it, him say, if you think you're bowing down to this 80-year-old body, think again, you're bowing to your own self. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how did he know I was thinking that? And, wow. and also, I just, I had come with others, I couldn't leave, but I thought, it reminded me of the Hare Krishnas on the street, and yeah. what am I doing here? And then right after coming up to him, hmm. and because of time, I won't go into the whole story, I, I sat down shortly after. I did bow. I just found myself bowing, hmm. sat up, went and sat down, mm -hmm. and had the most profound experience. The way it, later I looked up the word for an, like an upside down waterfall, it was a geyser. Holy mackerel. A geyser yeah. of joy. Yeah. And my head went back and I thought, I know this feeling. I, mm. I know this. I'm, it was like I came home. And in that experience, I was back to that pure joy of the child mm -hmm. without any layers. So here we connect a lot That's of the amazing. dots. Yeah. And I just kept going. Um, and I learned what meditation could be. Mm -hmm. And that has, uh, and to keep on coming home that way, yeah. and to see that in others, which I'd also glimpsed as a child in the very people oh, that were, that yeah. were, there was a girl that would, was a bully. We didn't yeah. have the word then. Yeah. And one day as she was cursing at me and throwing things at me, I had tried to ask if she wanted to play. She, <laughs> I saw this little light in her heart. 
Wow. I, I had no words for this, no concepts. Yeah. I saw a little flame and I knew it was her goodness and her kindness and mm. her, and that all the rest was, she was afraid. I, I, that same day I'd seen her mother curse at her and throw mm. things at her. And I went home and tried to tell my parents. Aww. And that didn't um, go well probably. No. <laughs> no. But yeah. I remembered. Oh, that's amazing. And then later, I, it, I, reminded, I was reminded and yeah. reminded of how to remember when I would forget, mm -hmm. how to find my way back to that knowing. Wow, that's amazing. If we could all, like the world is in just such a tough place, you know, if we could all see that little flame instead of reacting to the negative behavior. Oh gosh, yeah. I have, if there's time, there's a little passage I was inspired to pull out. Not a now. No, so I, go no, for not, it. Oh, no, oh. I was going to say in our next section, because it's from Tremble of Love and it deals with what we're talking about. Oh. And so if there's time, sure. um, I could, when we get. You Why know, don't, do you want to just say it and that will be <clears throat> our closing for this, for this part? Say. The, the, the little passage is yeah. probably two or three minutes, so maybe that's too long. Uh, we could try it. Just do it, though, if you... Okay. <laughs> there is? Okay. Read a little faster. This is, okay. No, I'm okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> this scene takes place, I'll just say, in a remote village in the Carpathian Mountains, and Yisrael, or the Baal Shem Tov, is, uh, in this, will be speaking to his daughter, whom he calls Levovi. In Zabia, in addition to cultivating the land, Yisrael had been cultivating a spiritual practice that had yielded rich fruit, the practice of dvekut, remembrance of his closeness to God. His father had been the first to teach him this when he was on his deathbed. Rebbe Eliezer had instructed him to remember, assuring him that he would not be alone. To remember was to focus on the energy at the root of all life and to feel one with that energy. For Yisrael, the practice of dvekut was not merely a mental activity, although it started with directing his mind. To remember was to feel the Shekhinah, the sacred presence, close. Not only during meditation, prayer, and study, but in his daily life as husband, father, farmer, and healer, Yisrael practiced remembering. He turned his attention to feeling, and in this way to knowing the unknowable force called God and by many other names. Remembrance was at once a path to awakening and the practice of remaining awake. After hearing him speak about the practice of Dvekut to their Sabbath guests, Dahlia, with her usual intent curiosity, approached her father, <clears throat> wanting to understand more. When I worry and become afraid, am I forgetting that God is with me? She asked. If you do forget, Lavovi, it is very easy to find one's way back. Mm. You can just Remember, but what should I remember? It is not such hard work, Yisrael reassured her, smoothing her brow and touching his daughter's cheek tenderly. Perhaps it will help to imagine it this way. Imagine a river with many times the current of the Cheramosh, a river of love that you may not see but can sense flowing through every being and instant of life. You can draw power from this stream of blessing at any time. All that is required is to pause and remember it's always there. Dahlia relaxed. Remembrance is a gentle moment-to-moment -moment practice, Lavovi. Mm. When we have forgotten, a hint is that we feel less joy. When we remember, there is deep joy and even relief. The relief one feels finding one's way home after being lost. Mm. He paused. We are here together to help each other remember. Wow. Yeah, it does, absolutely. Oof. Yeah. I'm going to say goodbye for now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will come back in part two. Thank you. When I was a little boy sitting 
on my mama's knee. She said, son, let me tell you about that. 